Paul always suspected King Crab was more of a title than a name. And he wants to be the first human to bend the claw. Because one day, the crustaceans will rise, and only Paul will be spared. Foresight's a wonderful thing. Invest in innovation, including 3D printing, with Opto. Welcome back to the show, Yuri. It's great to have you on Octo Sessions again. Uh, how are you doing? How are things? I'm um, great. Thanks. Thanks for having me on again. Thanks very much for joining us. Okay. I think today we're going to focus on reshoring. It's a theme that uh, one of your ETFs offers significant investment exposure to. So we'll get to the ETF and the actual product later on in the interview, but I want to start with introducing this theme to the listeners. So a simple question to start. Can you perhaps define reshoring for us and explain how it differs from offshoring and nearshoring as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, I, I think it's um, I, I think it's a it, it's a theme that many people will be aware of, but maybe they don't really understand exactly the dynamics and and how it's it's come about. Um, what happened is we go back to the 1960s. Um, a lot of American industrial companies started to offshore their manufacturing production. 1960s was a peak of U.S. manufacturing as a share of GDP. I think it was somewhere near 27%. And they saw a massive cost advantage of manufacturing in places like China. They were starting to industrialize and starting to have access to very low cost labor. At the time, uh, and I believe it's uh, the, the wage differential between a manufacturing worker in China versus a U.S. worker were you know, something like 40 times, maybe even bigger. And uh, this process started in the 1960s and then was pushed forward by globalization, trade liberalization around the world, particularly two major events. The first was the WTO creation in 1995, I believe, and then the ascension of China into WTO, uh, the World Trade Organization in the early 2000s. This basically unlocked this manufacturing base and built China's manufacturing powerhouse and a lot of companies moved their manufacturing there. This is offshoring. Um, what's been happening, and I think it's been happening under the surface of the last 15 years or so, is the world has faced a series of risks and a series of problems and challenges which have started to strain supply chains. And those strains on the supply chains are forcing companies to make different decisions with their manufacturing bases. So the decisions could be you could move to a close location to the end market, which is typically the US, the biggest consumer market in the world. That's called near shoring. So you're getting closer. Sometimes a near is also uh, used as friend shoring. So you, you move to a country that's near, but near in a political sense. So a country like India or Vietnam, which is maybe a little bit more aligned uh, democratically and politically and, and to the United States. Um, but really, ultimately, the real kind of trend as well has been what we call reshoring, which is moving manufacturing back to the home market of the United States. And this is a trend that started in Ernst and has been pushed forward by government policy, by COVID pandemic, by these deglobalization forces, and really uh, the rise again in a rivalry between China and the United States. Got it. Yeah. And I think we'll get into government kind of regulation and policy later on and how that's influencing this this trend, particularly as we ramp up for the US election later this year. But if we focus for now on the macro factors influencing American companies in particular to, to reshore right now, give us a, a kind of better sense of what those macro factors are. Yeah, I, I think one of the most interesting things that I read was sort of you know, if you're in a boardroom in the United States, you're running an industrial company or manufacturing business of any sort. And by the way, this is many different kinds of businesses. You know, the COVID was a real shock po point, right? You had a supply chain issues that reverberated across these businesses. And I think in a boardroom, you know, as a manager, you probably get one pass, right? That was COVID, looks one off, could have been. But actually, when you sit down as a board, you probably think, okay, these risks aren't going away. The globalization is continuing. There are trade wars going on. There's actual wars, unfortunately, going on as well. Supply chains look pretty weak. And the cost differentials that maybe existed that were sort of 40 times are maybe much, much lower now, partly because of policy in, in places like China that drove minimum wages up double digits every year. Over time, that compounds. Suddenly, the difference is maybe four times, right? At which point, the risk starts to feature in the conversation. 
i.e. what's the risk that I won't get these goods that take four to six weeks to ship across the ocean. And that decision, also the fact that managers probably won't be around the next time there's a supply chain crisis, is probably forcing boardrooms and everyone to make that decision. This is kind of the main macro factors that are driving it. And then the, the, if you look at sort of a total cost of ownership, a lot of other benefits arise being close to the end market. You can respond faster to demand. You reduce your carbon footprint of shipping all of these goods across the world. You can reduce your inventories. You can manage your operations and you can build manufacturing that's maybe more future proof. Uh, there's great examples of companies like Black & Decker saying, you know, look, maybe in China, we had a supply line that had sort of 30, 40, 50 people on it, manufacturing stuff. Now they're building a manufacturing plant, 10 to 12 people working on it using modern automation tools. And they think they can get that down to sort of two to three individuals producing the same amount of output. And that's what modern automation tools are allowing them to do. And that's what's reinvigorating what we call the industrial renaissance in the US. Got it. Yeah. And I want to get into a few of those company examples and just key to understand, I suppose, where those company examples are tending to kind of emanate from, which industries are particularly inclined to this, toward this reshoring trend. But before we do, um, we've talked about some of the macro factors there, which helps to set the context. But I think uh, a moment or so ago, you alluded to the geopolitical tensions influencing this trend. So keen to dig into that. How have trade wars and those increasing geopolitical tensions influenced the reshoring strategies for U.S. firms? Yeah, I think this is really fascinating because we all read headlines about this. And I think there was an expectation that uh, Joe Biden's administration would have been more positive towards trade. And actually, that's not been the case. And people were looking forward to that in a way and maybe said, oh, the Trump tariffs and the Trump trade jitters were an aberration. Actually, if you dig under the surface and you read some economics papers on this, uh, America's tilt towards or away from globalization and towards a more trade protectionist policy it happened about 15 years ago. It started 15 years ago. So it predates kind of uh, these administrations. The politics is what we read about, but what, what's actually happening in the trade rooms and discussions is started 15 years ago. And the reason I cite that is because something that started 15 years ago tends to be, a, you know, you don't see these factors changing. And these, this means it could be a multi-decade trend. And that, that's trade wars, right? And those will probably continue. There's nothing you can see that's going to change that. You're seeing spats between Europe and China on electric vehicles. You're seeing spats between the US and China on semiconductor equipment. This is uh, you know, a, a trade war in every sense you can imagine, right? Now, the countries are very dependent on each other. So I'm not suggesting this will break overnight, but in many ways, the second derivative is, is not going the right way. Now you layer on top of that other macro factors. Uh, we're talking about, uh, let's, let's take what's happened in the major trade canals of the world, right? The arteries, uh, the Red Sea carries 12% of global trade is currently in a serious situation because of the war going on around there and the rebels attacking ships. So you're now having ships use trade routes that haven't been used since the 18th century sailing around Africa. You have issues in the Panama Canal. You had that last year. They were very acute. Uh, and people probably don't know this, but the Panama Canal requires water to be pumped from a big lake nearby to pass the container ships through it. And that lake has one of the lowest water levels of recorded history because of a lack of rains and, and other issues. And so I think what's happening is that um, companies are looking at that saying, whoa, whoa, you know, I mean, the Panama Canal carries 40% of container uh, traffic into the United States. It's massive. And lots of these container ships just have to offload these ships because there's not enough water for them to pass with that kind of weight. And this is creating further and further issues. Then you've got uh, what happened in Ukraine and you layer all of these risks on top of each other. And if you're running a big corporate multinational company with supply chain stretched, you're starting to think, oh, there's a lot of risks out there. Maybe the next manufacturing capacity I'll start to future proof and build in the US. And that's the macro factors driving this. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a sort of plethora of different macro factors, multifaceted as well. You've got those geopolitical tensions, environmental factors, you've got uh, the US kind of regulation and policy that we'll get into later on. But keen to understand, as I said earlier, which industries this is most evident in and where we're seeing the most examples of companies reshore at the moment. 
Yeah, this is a really interesting thing. And you can actually go on a, a sites like the Rishoring Institute or even the White House itself, and they're tracking these, these projects and announcements that are being made by companies. It's actually across the board. Uh, what's quite interesting is that, and this is partly because of the incentives which we'll talk about, it's a lot of modern industries that the US is keen to rebuild. It's almost thinking like, how do I future-proof my industrial production base? Uh, so we're talking about semiconductors, electric vehicles, batteries, all of these things. And by the way, this isn't like, it's across the political spectrum, right? A lot of this investment is going into um, what I would call, uh, you know, uh, states like Arizona, you know, that you wouldn't typically associate with, say, electric vehicles or batteries. Um, so th that's that's a big part of new construction that's going down. But it's, it's everywhere, right? Companies like Lego, companies that are tool companies, bicycle companies. You know, imagine for the first time bicycles are being manufactured in the U.S. Why? Well, Walmart has gone and said, look, we want to invest $350 billion over the next couple of years, making essentially a made in America push for some of our manufacturing. And they're asking their suppliers to set up manufacturing in the U.S. Uh, this is happening across lots of areas and maybe areas people aren't aware of like pharmaceutical supply chains uh did you know that there about 80 percent of generic medicines of the top 100 generic medicines have no u.s manufacturing source and so that means that the u.s is acutely dependent on manufacturing of of key ingredients or key generic medicines on supply chains and if those falter there's going to be a problem and so we're seeing this across sectors and it's permeating out into the economy starting with some of these future-proofed industrial production points, classic production, and then other areas as well. And there are plenty of examples. You can see them on our website, uh, Tema ETFs, of companies doing it. You know, it's Apple and Boeing, it's big companies moving manufacturing to the US. Yeah, great. We'll put a link in uh, the episode description to that page as well uh, to get some extra detail on those examples. But I think that nicely sets the context. So now we understand the kind of power of this theme. But interested to understand now why this theme is so powerful in the current environment. I mentioned earlier, of course, it's a US election year. So I'm keen to understand to what extent there is bipartisan support for this trend, or should those considering a reshoring investment actually be rooting for one of the two candidates? Yeah, so th this is an interesting question. We get asked a lot by clients and senior investors in, uh, in the fund and in this area about this, this topic. Um, I think what the way we see it is that the major um, bipartisan bills that were passed to support this trend. And here I'm talking about the Inflation Reduction Act, the Infrastructure Act, and the CHIPS Act as well. Together, these amount to about 1.85 trillion of support for effectively reshoring industries and rebuilding the infrastructure around this reshoring trend. This, these bills passed with bipartisan support by the, by the most part, right? There was obviously some negotiation. And the reason for that is, I think America understands it has two, two really major challenges. One, it needs to rebuild this manufacturing base that it's lost and seeded over the last multiple decades. That's why we think this will last over time. And it also needs to upgrade its infrastructure, which is in bad shape. And this is just quite clearly easy for a politician's support. Rebuild roads, get jobs into the United States, support manufacturing. And this is also important because it's often in swing states you know, in the middle and the kind of rust belt of the United States is really where a lot of this investment is going to go into. So you've got government policy, but what's really important and I think important for our listeners to understand is this trend is not about the government. You know, it's not going to be a flashbang of these acts and then it'll disappear. In many ways, these are companies making these decisions. This is why it's so exciting in terms of a structural trend, because we don't really like to invest behind government policy because it can be fickle and it can change. And we see the government act and also the support from the different sides of Congress as accelerants of this trend. And this acceleration, it, you're going to see it into the election. Joe Biden is making a big push. You know, there's a government website just focusing on all the projects that are being supported by these acts and by reshoring as well. And you obviously know um, Donald Trump is a big supporter of reshoring and, and kind of, let's call it deglobalization and a rebuilding of US manufacturing base. So both sides really support it. As I said, one of the things that people don't talk about is a lot of this investment is also going into states that you wouldn't associate necessarily with uh, one side or the other political spectrum. And that's why we think once the election passes, there'll just be more and more support for this. Yeah, it certainly seems that way. I mean, if, if we look back at kind of the US's 
historical kind of legacy in this space and how actually the US compared to, to other nations. Uh, I read that the US have been awarded D, a D grade for its infrastructure by uh, their own uh, Society of Civil Engineers for the past 19 straight years, apparently. I think I read that on a research report on the TEMA website. So that sees the US, as I say, lag some best in class countries like China, like Japan, in terms of percentage of GDP spent on infrastructure. So perhaps you can just explain how reshoring is starting to address this legacy infrastructure deficit. I mean, this is this is really interesting. We see infrastructure kind of the first leg of, of helping rebuilding. You've got a like if you look at the official government statistics, you've got a, a basically a parabolic boom in manufacturing construction, so building of factories. Now, of course, a lot of these factories, as they're breaking ground, are realizing, you know, we don't have the infrastructure that we need. I'm talking about grid access. I'm talking about waterways. I'm talking about water, utilities, roads, airports, all of the things that you need around the factory to make it really viable and work well. And this is where these government monies are coming in to support building these parts. Um, you know, the U.S. grid is a desperate need of investment. U.S. roadways are also need of upgrading. I mean, most of the audience will have flown through U.S. airports. A lot of them are in really need of extra investment and rebuilding. And that's what a lot of this money is going into. And companies are saying to the government and saying to local authorities, look, we need you to help build this infrastructure. We'll build the factories and bring the jobs here, but you need to support us in this. Um, and of course, you layer on top of that trends like AI and data center build outs. You know, there's, it's suddenly there's this big demand for a rebuilding of US infrastructure. And that's a key sub theme of this the reshoring trend. Yeah, yeah, got it. And uh, with that in mind, then perhaps you can just explain how reshoring, reshoring, sorry, benefits the US economy at large, particularly in terms of job creation. We met, we mentioned the manufacturing sector there, but give us a wider sense of where we're seeing this actually manifest the most. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I I, I um I'm, I'm always a bit. It's a bit difficult to answer this. The economy is a really difficult place to understand, right? It's vast especially the US economy, um, really to influence the US economy's trajectory in terms of growth rate, you have to affect the US consumer and that this isn't really a part of that. But I think fundamentally, it's about a rebalancing of the economy. Uh, the US economy has really shrunk in terms of its manufacturing capacity. As I mentioned before, if you look at manufacturing as a percentage of GDP, I think in the 1960s, or even a bit later than that, it was sort of, you know, we're talking 20, 30% nearly of the economy was manufacturing. Today, that number is like 10. And it's, but it's just starting to edge up. And we, I think there'll be a rebalancing towards manufacturing over time. And that's what the legacy of this trend will be. I think there will be a boost in terms of construction and new infrastructure, which in theory should also increase the productivity of the economy. If you're starting to get more productive factories and investment, manufacturing should become more efficient as well, which is a way of helping uh, the overall growth rate of the economy. Now, of course, this is what I say is so difficult, right? Because actually manufacturing in the US is only about, as we said, 10% of the economy, right? So even if you improve productivity and uh, create jobs there, it doesn't really move the dial. The service sector is that much bigger. But over time, if you rebalance and you're having positive productivity growth, that should help the economy in the long run. If you look at some of the statistics, we're for the first time seeing this labor productivity start to grow again after a couple of decades of not growing. And that could be partly because of the reshoring movement. Now, it has its fair share of skeptics because of what I said, it's a small part of the economy, unclear what it looks like. A sec the second bit of the legacy is, of course, new technologies and new areas. And what's quite encouraging about reshoring is it's, it's being built with a future proof in mind. How do you future proof US manufacturing? And that, um, you're just seeing a lot of interesting stuff there. So in the future, maybe the US will be in a better position because it will have maybe a domestic pharmaceutical ingredients industry, a domestic semiconductor manufacturing industry, domestic electric vehicle and battery industry. And these are probably the industries of the future. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, well, really interesting time to potentially get involved in the theme then. And with that in mind, we can use that as a segue, I think, to talk about the Tema American Resor Reshoring ETF ticker RSHO. And um, of course, as we say, that, that offers exposure to the theme that we've been discussing today. But it does that by allocating to three categories within the reshoring theme as a whole, three subsets of companies. So perhaps you can talk us through what those are. Yeah. So, so you can imagine we, we, before launching the product, we did a lot of work thinking about 
you know, is this really a sustainable trend? Is this structural? Is this long term? We talked to companies as well. And we really started to believe that this is something, a real transformation that could last multiple decades. And so you're entering the right neighborhood, as we like to call it, in the way we, we structure it, of the equity market. So you're in the right neighborhood. But what does that actually mean? It means that if this trend is really there and you identify the right companies, those companies will see better growth rates, better margins, and therefore re-rating and then increase in their stock price, which is ultimately what we want to see. But the question is, of course, what is a reshoring company? Uh, and that isn't that easy to identify. You can't screen for it. You, you can't find some metric. You can't even use modern AI tools to really find it, which we've tried. What you need is to really understand the announcements that these companies are making, the moves that they're making. And what we've said is kind of from a top down, and remember this is a bottom up fund, you can identify kind of three groups of companies. You have the reshoring manufacturers. These are companies that are bringing manufacturing back to the United States and gaining the advantages that I mentioned earlier, closer to their end client, better supply chain management, less risk, et cetera, lower cost, even if you include automation and the future. Then there is what we call the reshoring facilitators. These are companies that are helping rebuild the US manufacturing base, where you can directly identify, okay, this company, this revenue is going to go up X because of this so-and-so project. And we do a lot of bottom-up groundwork to match for example, the government monies or where these reshoring facilities are on the ground versus where the companies are exposed in the facilitator bucket. And then you finally have what we call reshoring beneficiaries. These are companies where it's maybe a little bit harder to directly identify, hey, their revenue is going to benefit from this, but we know it will broadly benefit of more than 50% of their revenue because they just benefit from more industrial activity in the US. Uh, a great example of that is, let's say, hazardous waste, a, a big position the more industrial activity you have in the US, the more hazardous waste gets produced, the higher the growth rate of a company like Clean Harbors or a company like Waste Management, but we own Clean Harbors in, in the fund. And what you see them saying is basically, hey, reshoring is real. Uh, previously, we would have grown industrial production plus one to two percent. Sorry, they would have previously said we're growing at industrial production. Now they're saying we can grow industrial production one to two percent higher and that one to two percent you know, compounds over time increases a lot of equity value for shareholders that's the kind of companies we're looking for yeah it's really interesting you mentioned there as you say it, it's not something you can kind of quantifiably screen for there aren't certain metrics that signal uh, and an alignment with reshoring as a theme but to dig a little bit deeper into your process then you know is there an experienced sort of management team that understand the nuances of these companies operations that are seriously familiar with these companies and does that then help you i suppose identify these reshoring businesses yeah i think the big thing about the fund that people should be aware of is it obviously focuses on what we call mid-cap companies which are as a underrepresented in people's portfolios you know especially if you own the s p 500 35, 37% of it is in these top 10 mega cap companies, you're increasingly losing that heartland of the mid cap, which historically has had very, you know, has suggested to have positive performance attributions to portfolios, especially if you look at the quality mid caps. Now, th this is a really important part of reshoring. We're looking for those under the radar reshoring winners. You know, Clean Harvest is not a household name that people know about. It's a company that requires a lot of work to identify and then to analyze and look at. We're very fortunate to have a fund manager by the name of Chris Semenuk. Chris has spent 30 years in the investment industry, and he's just uh, any kind of industrial specialist through and through. He knows a lot of these companies firsthand, their management teams, where they've you know grown up with him. And he um, manages the fund, and he's looked after, he's basically, his job is to identify these under the radar companies. Um, and to do the analysis. And a lot of this involves talking to the management teams, actually visiting the sites, which we do quite a lot, and trying to understand what's going on. Where is this money being allocated? How do we, what's the next trend? And trying to move dynamically with the trend. And that's why it's very important to have an active process here. Yeah. Um, and I, I think I saw a recent interview from your CEO on Bloomberg, where he talked about just how important due diligence is, particularly in this space, not least because a lot of these companies are making promises in respect to their reshoring kind of activities, uh, given the kind of positive, I suppose, political PR that they can get from that. Yeah. And then obviously it's your team's job to ensure that they're actually following, following through on those promises and actually executing on their reshoring promises. So yeah, yeah absolutely. 
Yeah, go on, sorry. No, just give, give us a sense of how that kind of extra due, due diligence actually manifests within your research process. Yeah, it, it's a, a client recently coined the term reshoring, reshore washing, or, you know, very mm. similar to like greenwashing claims. Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course, right? You get pub pub publicity, people are jumping on it because they think it'll re-rate their stock. It's basically our job as analysts and investors to, to to dig through to the actual truth of what's going on. Are these companies actually doing that? I think it's a big feature of the fund. Chris is very passionate about making sure that we're not looking for companies that are just using reshoring as on a slide deck to make themselves look good, but there are companies that are actually out there winning business and seeing this transform their company's uh, outlooks both in terms of revenue growth by margin profiles as well. You do that in part by partnering with quality businesses, not just sort of your run of the mill reshoring companies. And I think that's an important aspect of why you really need active management, right? You can't just go, okay, I'll screen for every company that's made a reshoring announcement. You're just gonna end up with a load of low quality businesses in there. Uh, you then have to also have quality overlays, which is really where the bottom up investment process at Tama kicks in. Are these, do these companies have good operating bases? Do they have cash flows and balance sheets to sustain the investment maybe required to become a reshoring business? Is there a valuation case to be made? And what's our edge here in investing in them? Those four are kind of the four pillars of our investment process. And you need those as well as being in, as I said, the right neighborhood of the stock market. Yeah, got it. Not dissimilar from the uh, AI kind of buzzword that a lot of companies and investor relation teams are using that those charts that showed that massive spike of references to artificial intelligence within company announcements and reports was, was interesting. So perhaps we're seeing something similar here on the reshoring side. And yeah, you can see it. We've got some data in some of our charts of like companies talking about reshoring. We use that as a way of saying, look, it's real. People are talking about it. We also have job announcements as well, but also, you know, real hard economic statistics like manufacturing construction. You can just look that up. It's, a, it's one of the few parabolic charts, you know, apart from Nvidia's share price that you've got in out there in the market right now. And we're investing behind that. And I think that's an important point, right? This is another source of growth outside of maybe tech and AI. And if you're long the market, you're long a lot of these themes already. And I, what we're talking to investors about right now is, hey, growth uh, basically you, you, you're over levered towards this technology space. The market is in a bit of a fragile space place, but technology offers growth. So what are some of the other areas of growth in the market that you can diversify into that are maybe uncorrelated to what's going on in your core portfolio? And reshoring is absolutely one of those with its sub themes of automation, electrification and US infrastructure as well. Yeah, got it. Well, I, I guess if we can turn our minds to the downside then and sort of play devil's advocate, if you can, what, what are the risks associated with an investment into reshoring at the moment? Yeah, look, I, I think I painted a very positive picture, right? A great top down uh, growth story, great companies in terms of quality getting exposed to the steam and how we're, we're allocating to those. But it's equity investing, right? This is a, a concentrated portfolio of kind of 30 to 40 names that are we think are the under the radar mid cap and some large cap winners from this trend. Now, the big risks are a lot of what's happening is that the, what we call phase one of reshoring is probably related mostly to the industrial economy. Now, industrials as a sector is very broad. So I think I would caution people from allocating, thinking about it as one thing. You know, it's got transport companies, it's got infrastructure, it's got a lot of different types of businesses, but it, it is a big exposure in the fund and industrials do tend to have more cyclical risk attached to them than other parts of the market. I think that is something we manage, try to manage quite carefully. But in theory, if we're in the right space, we're hopefully going to mitigate that risk, if that makes sense. So the reshoring is adding extra growth. So even if you have cyclicality, the through cycle growth rate of some of these companies is higher, and that should lead to a re-rating and better share price performance. But it's something you have to be very, very careful of. The second thing is obviously, you know, the world is not sitting still and watching the US rebuild its manufacturing base and seeding manufacturing share, right? So there are going to be retaliations, there's going to be different developments on the global scale, and also even US politically at home, that might throw this trend in one direction or another. And that could be some a risk that we need to monitor carefully. And finally, right, you, you're investing in stocks, things go wrong, you need to, and that's why having an active manager look after this for you is very, very important. Yeah, well, I'm keen then to finish the interview, I suppose, by seeing how all of that translates into investment performance. You can give us a sense, perhaps, of the performance of the fund since in inception. But after that, also look ahead to the end of 
the year and beyond into early 2025. What are the key headwinds and tailwinds investors should be looking out for and your team are keeping a close eye on? Yeah, that's great. Um, so you can find our performance and all the official disclosures related to it on our website. So I encourage people to go and check out the latest performance numbers. Uh, if you go to temaetfs.com slash RSHO, uh, or you just click on the R show title, you can see the performance numbers there in the fact sheet and all the re related disclosures. I mean, the fund has performed very well. Um, it's up, I think, 48 or 49% uh, at the time of, of shooting this video. Uh, it's outperformed the S&P mid cap index by something like 15% since it started. And it's outperformed even the S&P 500, which is actually quite a unique thing to have done considering how strong the S&P 500 has been driven by these mega cap tech companies. So the story continues is a lot of strength in terms of the companies and the investment process. Um, I think in terms of things we're looking out for, right, we're watching things carefully. I think I would mention three things. One, how is this trend starting to permeate to other parts of the economy? You know, we've invested heavily in these beneficiaries and also these facilitators. They've started to build that infrastructure already and the money's starting to flow. And the, this has already pushed the share prices up of, like, say, materials and infrastructure companies. What's chapter two? Uh, I think which chapter two involves uh, looking more at the factory floor as that gets built up, right? Maybe you've built the shell of the factory. What kind of equipment's going in there? I think what are some of the trends within that? Things like electrification is a very powerful trend. And we think that that's going to continue. And then thinking more broadly, what are some of the other sectors where reshoring is going to take hold? And I mentioned earlier healthcare as one. And we've made some investments very recently in companies like Danaher and Lonza, which really are providers of equipment and actually contract manufacturers themselves of pharmaceutical ingredients. Um, Danaher is one of the leaders in bioprocessing, uh, Lonza basic contract manufacturers pharmaceuticals, and they recently bought a massive plant from Genentech in, in the US, and they're investing more in US manufacturing of pharmaceuticals. You heard from the AstraZeneca CEO, he's basically saying, you know, customers are telling us they want drugs manufactured in the US for, and that I think is a big thing. And that is a trend maybe the market hasn't caught on to, and they will. And, that, and things like the Biosecure Act, which is again, what you always see with this, extra policy that accelerates the trend and we want to get ahead of that and that's what we're looking for yeah fantastic it seems then that pharmaceutical sector is one to watch particularly in relation to the reshoring theme moving on yeah basis. it helps as well allay some of the cyclical side of as, as you position a little right. bit more balanced portfolio and these are some of the areas we're, we're looking at and we're watching the cyclical side very very carefully as that unfolds with various statistics as well yeah, of course. Well, great. I think that that gives us a really nice roundup on which to end. Uh, I think that just leaves me to say thank you very much for joining us on the podcast, Yuri. As, sure, as my pleasure. Thanks.